Hi everyone. So in this video, I'm going to compare three methods for checking a person's DNA. Those three being whole genome sequencing, whole exome sequencing, and genotyping. Each of these methods are common DNA consumer tests, which is why I want to compare the pros and cons of each to help you guys choose the right one for you. I'm going to compare these three on how much of the genome they cover, how they work, their cost, and what they can tell us. First, we need to do a quick review. The human genome is 3.2 billion base pairs long. 1.2% are sequences that code for proteins, also called coding DNA. The rest is non-coding DNA that sits between coding sequences. Genes are actually composed of coding DNA and non-coding DNA. When the DNA of a gene is transcribed, the non-coding pieces are removed. Then the coding sequence is translated into a protein. Proteins are the workhorses of the cell, which is why if there's a problem in a gene sequence, there will likely be a problem with the protein that gene codes for. That protein may not do its job correctly, which sometimes gives the carrier a sign or symptom. So you might think, ah, then only the coding DNA matters. But unfortunately, the genome is more complex than this. Nature didn't just stick all those non-coding DNA sequences in between the coding ones for fun. No, they have purposes. So a lot of the non-coding intergenic DNA actually helps regulate how the coding pieces are transcribed, how much they're transcribed, and when they're transcribed. Intergenic DNA or non-coding DNA also plays a role in how DNA actually folds, and therefore what genes can be accessed and read. So this brings us to the primary way that these three methods differ, and that is their coverage of the genome. So whole genome sequencing sequences the entire genome, so that's 3.2 billion base pairs whereas whole exome sequencing is only delivering the coding parts of the genome, which is about 1.2% of the genome, or about 38 million base pairs. Meanwhile, genotyping is only covering a few hundred thousand locations in the genome, which is about 0.01% of the genome. In terms of how these tests actually work, whole genome sequencing and whole exome sequencing are quite similar. First, DNA is isolated from the sample, then it's broken into little pieces. In whole genome sequencing, all the DNA fragments of the right size get little ends called adapters attached to them so that they can stick to the flow cell in the sequencing machine. However, in whole exome sequencing, the exons, or regions that code for genes, are isolated from the sea of DNA fragments, and then have adapters attached to them. Thereafter, the sequencing process is nearly identical. However, genotyping works very differently. Instead of sequencing the DNA base by base to discover the sequence, genotyping starts with a device called a microarray. A microarray is about 10 centimeters long and has thousands of tiny wells. Each well has a bead in it. Stuck on the surface of the beads are many copies of the same DNA sequence. This DNA sequence stops one base before the base of interest. In this picture, I'm just drawing one for simplicity. The sample DNA is then broken into small pieces and washed over the array. When the sample DNA complements the DNA sequence on the bead, they stick to each other. Then the base where the SNP is, is incorporated and emits a laser excited light signal where its color tells the scientist which base it is. So what are these bases of interest that the microarray is testing for? They're called SNPs. A SNP is a single base at a particular location in the genome that differs among people. For example, some people might have T thionine, whereas other people have A adenine. A genotyping array, also called a SNP microarray, can test for hundreds of thousands of these SNPs in a person's genome at the same time. However, if you have a SNP microarray done on your genome, for most of the SNPs, you're going to have the reference base or the base that most people have, and it's the base that we are expecting, which is more or less uninteresting. So when you get a SNP microarray done in your genome, it's not like you're going to find hundreds of thousands of interesting SNPs that you have. It's more likely that you'll find a few hundred interesting SNPs. If you consider that most people have, on average, four to five million variants in their genome compared to the reference genome, and when you do a SNP microarray, you might be confirming you have between 
100 and 200 of those SNPs, the amount of information you're getting is very limited, so it's important to keep that in mind. Now, as you can imagine, the genome coverage of these tests is related to how much they cost. So on average for whole genome sequencing, you're going to be looking at around $1,000. For whole exome sequencing, probably between $400 to $500, heavily dependent on the coverage that you're getting. And then for genotyping, that's going to be $100 to $200 maybe. But it's worth noting that as sequencing technology advances, the cost of sequencing, meaning whole genome or whole exome, continue to drop. But at the end of the day, we usually do a DNA test because we're interested in finding out something about you from your DNA. Depending on what specific question you have about your DNA, these methods are going to vary in how effective they are at answering your question. So let's start with the question of ancestry. In that case, the more of the genome you cover, the more data you get, the more accurate your result is going to be. And that's because ancestry is complex. So let me explain population of people doesn't differ from one another by having a variant that the other population doesn't have. This almost never happens. Instead, two populations differ by how common a variation is in their population. For example, variant X might occur in 20% of population A, but 60% of population B. Therefore, if you have variant X, you're more likely to come from population B than population A. The more variants like this that can be considered to determine ancestry, the more statistically powerful the ancestry prediction becomes. This is why genotyping for determining ancestry can be inaccurate, because only a small number of variants are actually being considered. So whole genome sequencing would be best, followed by whole exome sequencing, followed by genotyping. Now let's say you have a very specific mutation in mind that you want checked in your DNA. So technically, in this case, genotyping would be enough. As long as that SNP is on the microarray lawn, then you get your microarray and the results come back and then you'll know if you have that mutation or not, which is great. But then let's say this mutation is related to breast cancer, which is what you are really interested in. Then the problem with that becomes every day we're finding out more about breast cancer and we're discovering more variants and more genes that have important roles to play in breast cancer. So by the time you get your results and find out if you have that one mutation, there might be 20 more mutations that are important for breast cancer that you now need to have tested to figure out whether you're actually at risk or not. You go talk to your doctor and they explain to you that in the vast majority of breast cancer cases, one of these three genes is mutated. And so you say, great, okay, I will go out and get whole exome sequencing because that is going to tell me the sequence of each of these three genes and I'll know if I have a mutation in one of them. So you go out and you get whole genome, whole exome sequencing done. And maybe you discover that you have a mutation in one of those genes and maybe you don't. You don't know if you have a mutation that is in front of one of those genes causing it to be expressed 10 times more than it normally would, potentially leading to cancer. So that's the kind of thing that you just don't know when you get your whole exome sequencing results. So let's say you're fed up, you're tired of getting different DNA tests, you go and get your whole genome sequence. Fantastic. Now you have your entire genome sequence. There are no questions remaining. You can check whether you have a mutation in your non-coding DNA or whether you have a mutation in your coding DNA. After whole genome sequencing, not only will you get a complete list of every single variant that you have compared to the average human, which is called your BCF file, but you'll also get a file called your BAM file, which will have your entire genome sequence in order. And you'll also get all of your raw sequencing data that came right off of the machine that can be analyzed at a later time with newer tools by different scientists or what have you. So with all of that data, you'll always be able to take advantage of the latest discoveries and apply what you learn to your daily life. And this is why I recommend whole genome sequencing because software will change and discoveries will be made in genomics, but your genome sequence will not change. It is literally timeless. So get it sequenced and keep that data safe forever and take advantage of what's in there for your whole life. If you're interested in completely private whole genome sequencing, I highly recommend Guardium. If you still have questions, comment below. I will actually answer. I really hope this video was helpful. Please like and subscribe. Thank you.